Good evening, Talia. Good evening, Trisha. Good evening, Lauren. God bless you all. Good evening, Edna. Amen. Good evening. Good evening, Perry. Roger, good evening. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you for the happy birthday wishes. I appreciate it. God bless you. Amen. And thank you all for the birthday wishes that many of you have, pretty much all of you, have given me today. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. God bless you, Camille, Angela. Amen, Roger. Yes, yes. Good evening, Edna. Thank you, Edna. Happy birthday. I appreciate it. God bless you. God bless each and every one of you. I thank God for you joining with me tonight. And, and we're going to be, thank you, Roger. I appreciate that. Um, truly, I'm grateful for another year that the Lord has blessed me to live on this earth. And I am eternally grateful. Thank you, Talia. I appreciate that. Amen. God bless you, Millie. Amen. Good evening, Angela. Amen. And so let's begin tonight's Bible study, because um, I actually signed on a little bit late. I actually just got in a few moments ago and had to kind of put things together pretty quickly. Um, and so let's begin tonight's study um, as we begin in prayer. Amen. So let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this blessed and blessed opportunity that we have, Lord God, to study your word. For your word is truth. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. And so, God, we thank you for all that you've given us, God. We thank you for your many blessings. I thank you for another year and another opportunity that I have to share with your people. And, Father, I do not share from my own mind or from my own heart. But, Lord God, I ask you to lead me tonight and that you would speak through me to your people. That, Father, they might find hope, that they might find life, light understanding, that they might f find empowerment, that God, they might find solutions, that God, that they might find direction for your word is how your servants are warned. And Father, we thank you. So give us free flow tonight. Lord God, rebuke the hand of the enemy that would try to hinder or stop this process. And I pray, God, that you would be glorified and that your people would be edified. Touch the souls of men and women, boys and girls. And Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you would cause for the sinner to repent, cause for the wayward one to return home, cause for the sinner, Lord God, to say, what must I do to be saved? Cause for the believer to be strengthened in his or her faith. God, I pray that you would bless us tonight with holy wisdom and ultimately understanding. Thank you, Father, for your word is excellent. Your word is just. It is pure. And we thank you for your word. So lead us tonight. Speak to us. Holy Spirit, take full control of our thoughts. Take full control of our comments. Take full control of the words that I speak and the meditations of our hearts. Forgive us of all sin, Father, anything that would hinder us, Lord God, from, from uh, speaking your word and from hearing and understanding your word. I pray, God, in Jesus' name that you would reveal to us your holy truth and that you would bless us here tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. If I didn't see your name while I was praying, welcome each and every one of you. The Lord has blessed us tremendously in the Word of God over the last, really, for quite some time. The Lord has blessed us to be able to share the word of God, and he has blessed many of you to receive the word of God and to walk a better walk, to walk a different walk. For the Bible says that if we are hearers only of God's word and not doers, then we only deceive ourselves. And right now, when you look around the world, when you look at what's happening in the world, and when you look at what's going on in the news and in our time, listen, people of God, this is not time to play. This is not time to trip and fall. This is the time to batten down the hatches, secure your anchor in God, and make sure that you are standing. The Bible says that we need to work out our own soul salvation with fear 
and with trembling. That word fear means reverencing, honoring, to honor God and to realize that God so loved the world, but don't forget God is also a judge. He is also a judge. And the scripture says that there's going to come a time where each of us are going to stand before this holy, loving, and just God, and we're going to give an account um, for the deeds done in our body and everything that we've said and everything that we've done and everything that we thought. We're going to give an account for every idle word spoken. We're going to give an account for our actions, for our reactions. And know this, the Bible says that if the watchman of the house knew that the thief was coming, he would stay awake and watch. And equally so, the word of God is telling us, make sure we stay awake Stay awake. Listen, and this is why we're studying the Word of God. This is why on my birthday, this is why I choose to come right back on here and to study the Word of God with you. Why? Because this is a journey for me too, and I want to make it. And, and listen, having a birthday is fine, but going to heaven is better. And we don't know the day or the hour, and so we need to stay in the Word of God. And so it's nothing wrong with a little celebration here, a little celebration there, but make sure you stay in that Word. And so I'm dedicated to this. I'm, I'm, God has called me to be faithful in this, and I want to help you so that you might also be faithful. So now, tonight's subject is part two of the cross, and, and if you miss Part one, my God, you need to go back and you need to watch it um, because part one develops the foundation of why we need the cross, why the cross is so important to us. God bless you, each and every one of you that are watching. Um, it's, it's, it's so important. The cross is so valuable. The cross is, is, is a necessity. And, and not only is it necessity as far as Christ is concerned, because Christ paid the ultimate price on the cross for our sins. For the Bible says the wages of sin is death. God's remedy, God's payment for sin is death. Um, you have to pay for what you've done. But Christ came. He loved the world so much until he says he doesn't want you to die. So he set up the stage to say, I'll die in your place. And so the cross, as it relates to Christ, we understand. For him dying on the cross, he has taken the price and pay, the payment for our sin, and he has freed us from the power of sin. We know that. We know that Christ freed us from the power of sin. But then Christ says these words. He says, if any man or woman, boy or girl, would come after me, let them first deny themselves, that's in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. So guess what? You and I have a cross as well. We have a cross. We have a burden. And the only way we can understand that is by examining the cross that Jesus bore. Um, we have a burden. Now, Jesus carried the cross, and I want you to hear this, and, and please, uh, Tricia, if you can, um, put this down in the writing so that it's, it's saved in the comment line. Um, or someone please do that for me. Um, Jesus' cross was not for Jesus. It was for somebody else. The, the burden that he carried was he was carrying somebody else's problem. The Bible says in Isaiah, for he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was, be, was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So we know that Jesus bore the cross for somebody else. This is why one of the first things Jesus tells each of us, he says, if you're going to come after him, one of the first things you got to do is deny yourself. Why? Because the burden that God has given you is not for just you, your children, your mama, your daddy, your sons, your daughter, your husband, or your wife. No. But the burden that God has given you is for strangers and people that you have yet to know. God has, um, God has a purpose that there is someone, God's purpose will meet their need, and God sends you. 
Christ says, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. So God sent Christ for the souls of men. And guess what? God, Christ sends you and I for the souls of men. There are men and women, boys and girls around the world, some of whom will not listen to Pastor Rodney, but they sit right next to you at work. Some of them will never um, become a friend of Pastor Rodney or come on these online Bible studies, but they ride the train with you every day. Some of them are in your schools. Some of them are people that you see, maybe where you buy your newspaper from, maybe where you get your lunch from. May you think that you got that job because of the fact of, of that God wanted you to make money. Come on, people of God. The earth is the Lord, the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. God says the cattle are mine, the silver and gold are mine. Everything belongs to him. And he says the wealth of the wicked are laid up or stored up for the righteous. So God did not, let me put this in quotation, God did not give you a job to make money or to make ends meet. For the Bible says, let him or her that works, work with their hands so that they might have something to give to somebody else in need. So if, if God is telling you to work so that you might help somebody else, then the question lies, who helps you? Who helps you? That is because my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. That's why the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything you have need of will be added unto you. The problem is too many of us are chasing after the silver and gold. And this is why we get tripped up. And so tonight's topic on part two is about warfare. It's about spiritual warfare that we're going through. Most of what many of us call warfare is not warfare, but it is our entanglement with the world. I'll say that again. Most of what many of us are going through that we call warfare or that we call the enemy is coming after me and the enemy. No, it is God trying to detangle you from the world. And God is trying to cause you not to have a love for this world. So some of the mess that you're going on at your job is because you are tangled up and you think that job is your source. And so God has got to get you to, my God, he's got to get you to hate the job so that you will once again look back to him. Some of you are having problems in relationship, and it's because in your mind, you can't see anyone else in your life but that person. And so because of that, you have made that person an idol. So God has allowed for chaos to happen in that because he said, I will not have any other God before me. Why is somebody attacking your child? Because you love your child too much. Why is someone attacking your mama or your daddy? Because you love them too much. It is important to know the Bible says everything of this earth will pass away. In other words, when we get into the kingdom, we're not going to be husband and wife. We're not going to be mother and daughter, son and father. We're not going to be brother and sisters, but we're going to be angels. And our only desire throughout eternity is to worship the one and true living God who makes us full and complete and entire, lacking nothing. And so because of that, everything of this earth will sooner or later pass away. That's why the word of God says, do everything that you do. Be a mother, be a father, be a husband, be a wife, be a pastor, be a minister, be a teacher. Do everything as unto the Lord right? Because if God is my motivator, if God is your motivator, why you are a good wife? No, you're not a good wife because he buys you things or he spoils you. You're entangled with the world if you do that. You're not a good husband because she can lay it down in the bedroom. No, that's entangled with the world. You are a good husband because you realize that Christ died for that person. That Christ, And even if, God forbid, if you find yourself in a situation, not that you walked into it, 
Not that you walked into a, a marriage with an unrighteous person, but if you find yourself married to somebody who is not born again, you're already married to them, that's why you don't have to leave them because of the fact of that this becomes your ministry. You know that you are an ambassador for Christ everywhere you go. When you go on your job, you're an ambassador. When you go to the store and you're buying a, a jug of milk, you are an ambassador. You must always keep your eyes open because you never know when God may cause you to have a lack of something. Maybe that time that you spilt that juice and it was the last bit of juice and you weren't plan on going to the grocery store. Or maybe you weren't plan on going to the dry cleaners, but you but you messed up your clothes. Or maybe you didn't plan on going to the shoemaker, but you broke a heel. You must start thinking that God is in control of everything in your life and nothing can happen in your life unless God allows it or commands it. And everything about your life is about reaching the loss. So when you go, stop fussing about the shoe because maybe the shoemaker needs to be saved. When you go to the grocery store, stop fussing about the line because maybe God allowed that line because there's somebody in that line that needs to see Jesus. So if you get caught up with the things of this life, if you get caught up with the things of this world, if you find yourself circumvented and surmounted by the thoughts of this life, you'll miss the point and what you think, yes, Mia, my ways, God says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. So what happens is that if you get caught up with the things of this world, then you will think you're in warfare, but you have never even touched warfare yet. You've never even touched warfare yet. You never can listen. Satan is not omnipresent. Satan is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere. He's not omniscient. Satan doesn't know everything. We give too many of us give the devil too much glory. Too many of us give the, the enemy too much glory. How do we give him glory? Because we're always talking about what we don't have and what we're going through versus talking about the victory that Jesus has already secured for us over 2,000 years ago. He secured your victory. You are more than a conqueror. You're more than an overcomer. You're more than victorious. And so we don't run from the battle. We don't cower and hide from the battle. No, we face the battle with power and authority because the cross, my God, the cross that we carry must be taken to Calvary. Calvary is the place of your death. It's the place where you're no longer alive. It's the place where you no longer have your own opinion. It's the place where you have, have, have surrendered all of you and said, God, here am I. See, listen, when Jesus was carrying the cross, the cross was heavy. The cross was heavy. When Jesus was carrying the cross, the cross was heavy. But you know when the cross stopped being heavy? When no longer was Jesus carrying the cross, but now the cross was carrying him. He was nailed to the cross. And the cross was now supporting his weight. The cross was now supporting his weight. And it's in that time when Christ can look at the people and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. It's in that time where he can look at a thief. Because no longer is he carrying the weight of the cross. The cross is now carrying him. And he has made up his mind that this is where I'm going to be. I will not call a thousand angels. Listen, sometimes people of God, when you are really in the fight of God, you will choose not to fight back. Glory to his name. I, I, want, to, I want to talk to those of you who are spiritually wise today. I want to talk to you who, who are spiritual mature today. I want to talk to the babies. I want to talk to those of you who've been wondering so much why there's certain things you pray about and God don't remove it. He may remove it for that one time, but then he brings it right back again. He allows it to come right back again. Why? Because God is not calling you to run from the fight. God is calling you to run into the fight. We are supposed to run into darkness to snatch out the souls out of darkness. In fact, remember the Bible says it was the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit. I'll say that again. It was the Holy Spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. 
It was the Holy Spirit that led him to be tried, to be tested. It was the Holy Spirit that led him to, to be confronted by the enemy. It was the Holy Spirit that led him to a place. Might I also add, it was God. It was our Heavenly Father who created the Garden Eden, a perfect place, but he also created something of temptation. He created the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he said, do not touch it. And once there is the law, do not, that's when your flesh is tempted. When God tells you don't do this, your flesh is now tempted to do it, right? And so what happened is that oftentimes we're so accustomed to hearing preachers and teachers and people who's going to tell you how to break every stronghold, how to break free of everything. Did my God, thank you, Holy Spirit. Did you not know that um, it, it was Samson who, when he revealed his secrets to Delilah, it was Samson that uh, had his eyes gorged out. And yet and still, God allowed him the power to destroy the enemy and himself. Y'all better listen. Listen, I want to talk to people who are mature. I want to talk to people who, who really, um, you, you've been... For, for a long time, maybe you've been swimming in the shallows, but every time you swim in the shallows, you're looking in that deep water and saying, why can't I go out there? Why can't I, I belong out there? Maybe you're hanging with the chickens and, and you're looking at an eagle flying ahead and you're saying, well, why can't I fly up there? It is because God is trying to tell you that it is time for you to understand what warfare is and what warfare is not. Warfare is not somebody getting on your nerve. Glory to God. No. Let me help you again. I'm going to say that again. Warfare is not somebody getting on your nerve. Warfare is not somebody trying to aggravate you or irritate you. That's not warfare. Why? Because the Bible says we must grow into the fullness of the stature of Christ. That's what the word of God teaches us. And so because we're growing into the fullness and stature of Christ, we have to exhibit and we have to manifest within ourselves, we have to manifest the things that Christ manifests. Hebrews chapter 12 says that he is the author and finisher of our faith. So the Bible says that we ought to look unto him. We got to watch him. We got to understand him. In fact, Christ said in the book of John, he says, this is eternal life, to know thee, the one and true living God, and the son that you have sent. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly and humble of heart. Come and you shall find rest for your souls. But he says, learn of me. We just spoke a few minutes ago. Someone just quoted that he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. So that means in order for us to understand the, the, the real battle when it comes to God, we got to understand God, which means I got to die. Because one of the attributes of Christ is, the scripture says, as a lamb or a sheep is dumb before its shearers, so he opened not his mouth. One of the attributes that you got to develop, in fact, it's one of the, one of the attributes of the nine, uh, um, uh, the fruit of the spirit, not fruits, but fruit of the spirit. It's one fruit with nine attributes. And, and one of the attributes of that fruit is long suffering. You got to be able to suffer long. You got to be able to go through the pain. You got to go through the, the craziness without moving, without being moved. You got to go through the craziness without getting aggravated. In fact, one of the, we talked about this on Monday, on Tuesday, we talked about this on Tuesday, that the word of God says that one of the things that we got to put away, it says put away wrath and put away anger. These are one of the things, two of the things that we got to get rid of, that we've got to come to the place where we don't get angry. So warfare is not somebody pissing you off. They're pissing you off because there's still something in you that's alive. There's still something in you that cares. I was telling one of my dear friends today that um, when I look at my life and I look at who God has made me, I'm like a leaf. Other people are like a tree. 
They're like a tree. A tree stands by the water and it grows and it shows. Look how big I am. Look how strong I am. No, I'm a leaf that fell off the tree and I'm now in the current of the Holy Spirit. I don't care where he takes me. I'm not fighting. I'm not paddling. I'm not, I'm not swimming against the current. I'm not doing, I'm just resting on the current saying, God, you take me wherever you want to take me. I have no opinion about it. I have no, no, no comment about it. I have no ideologies about it or psychologies about it. I'm just going with the flow of the Holy Spirit. And there's a lot of people that don't understand that. And so what they want to do, they want to say, no, 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 you got to have a plan. No, you got to put something together. You got to have a plan. You got to know what's next and what's this. No, no, no. I am so glad. My God, I am so glad to be in the presence of God and to be still. Jesus told Martha, he says, Martha, you are worried about so much stuff. You're worried about so many things. He said, but Mary has chosen the better part. And the better part is Mary was sitting at the feet of Christ. She was sitting at the feet of Christ. She was not anxious for anything. She was not worried about anything. That's why the word of God says that godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay, so now let's now we're telling you that spiritual warfare is not somebody to get on your nerve. Somebody getting on your nerve is just a tool. My God, it's a tool that God is using to show your weakness. Do you hear me? That means if you got that coworker, if you got that husband or that wife or that son or that daughter, or you got uh, uh, God bless you, Andrea. If you got that that uh, cousin or that aunt or uncle or that neighbor or maybe somebody who's watching you on Facebook and they're getting on your nerve, it is showing you your weakness. And whereas you might be, oh my God, listen, y'all better hold on to your seatbelts, right? where you might be standing there looking at them and rebuking them in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I, I plead the blood of Jesus against you. I bind you, devil. What if God sent them? Are y'all hearing me tonight? What if God sent them to show you where your floor is? Then you will find that you have no power. You will find you have no power to stop them. Why? Because the power that you're using to stop them is the power that sent them in the first place. Because the Bible says, glory to his name, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, I just told you that, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will lead people to you to get on your nerve. Because you've been lying to yourself and telling you that, oh, I got the peace of God. Oh, I got the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And God says, okay, let me show you how much, let me show you the measure of your peace. Let me show you what, what, what you're going through right now. You, you don't realize that Christ said it best. He says, I am the vine and you are the branch. You're the branches. He says, just like the branch cannot subsist, abide, live, survive, bear fruit without the vine, neither can you. So many of us, what happens is that we get this inflow, if you will, of God's power, right? Maybe through a service, maybe through a message, and we feel emboldened. We feel powerful, right? And then we go out on that power, on the strength of that power, not realizing that we can only go as long as God says go. And while we're going, even though we're exhibiting power, we still must depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. We still must depend on the power. Listen, think about this, a battery, a battery. Let me see. If I, yeah, I have a battery right here. Let me, let me, let me break out a little prop. Okay. This battery, this battery has power in it, right? Power was put into it. Power was put into it, but this battery is powerless until you use it. But the moment that you put this battery in to be used and you disconnected it from the source that gave it its power, 
this battery becomes weak. And many folks don't know that. They don't know that until after they've been drained. And after they've been drained, after they've been emptied, now they're crying out for a charge. Now they're crying out for a charge. But the truest source is not the battery, but the truest source is the unit that stays connected. The unit that stays connected. This unit is exhibiting power, but it stays connected. And as long as it stays connected, this unit never gets weak because the power is constantly flowing. And so when it comes to warfare, before we get into warfare, God shows us where we've disconnected ourselves from him and where it's not God, but it's us. Oh yeah, you're exhibiting power, but this is your own power. This is your own knowledge. This is your own ability. And God is saying, I'm trying to teach you that in the midst of your successes, in the midst of your living, come on now, many of us, when we want that house, we fast and pray and fast and pray and fast and pray. And then when we get the house, we spend more time decorating the house than fasting and praying. Uh, many of us, we want the car. And we fast and pray and fast and pray and, and ask a friend, can you get a prayer through? Then once we get the prayer, now we're riding in the car and we don't have time to come to church. Many of us pray, Lord, give me that job. Give me that job. Y'all pray for me that the Lord give me favor, that the Lord opens the door and God opens the door. But now you can't come to church on time because now you're at work. See, you're like that battery. And so you're going to exhibit, you're going to move for just a little bit of time. You're going to exhibit just a little bit of strength. But after a while, my friends, I don't care if you're a triple A, double A. I don't care if you are nine volt. I don't care if you're a car battery. After a while, in a moment, your strength is going to ebb away. Every day that you use it, you're going to get weaker and weaker. Every day that you expend it, you're going to get weaker and weaker. Every day that you help somebody else, you're going to get weaker and weaker. And too many believers, Satan doesn't have to bother you. Satan doesn't have to um, send his angel, his imps to come after you. Satan doesn't have to tempt you and mess with you. Why? Because you are your own worst enemy. You will not last. You will not go any further. You will not extend your life. You will not. The Bible says, can you by your own thoughts make your very hair grow or your statue grow? You can't do any of that. So if you can't do what is least, what makes you think you could do anything? The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. So what does the cross teach us? The cross teaches us that even Christ who came from glory, Christ who came from glory, came from glory to earth. And Christ came down here knowing the Father. He know he came from the Father. He knows he's going back to the Father. But yet and still, Christ on this earth, when he became sin, even Christ said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In other words, I feel a disconnect in my spirit. I feel a disconnect in my soul because now I have become sin. And God himself says, your sins have separated you from me so that I won't hear you. So what happens is that the cross reminds us that my God, the cross reminds us that we can't be a battery. We can't be a rechargeable battery or door cell battery or any kind of battery you want. No, we must be plugged in. I remember the commercial used to say, plug it in, plug it in. You got to stay plugged in. You got to stay connected to that throne. You got to stay connected to the Holy Spirit at all times. You cannot separate yourself at any time. For the moment that you separate yourself, that's a moment of weakness. That's a moment of entrance for the enemy. That's a moment of testing. The moment that you stop seeing your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, your cousin, your family, your job, the moment you stop seeing them as God's child, my God.
I'm about to shout all in this place. The moment you stop seeing them as God's property and you now start seeing them as your property, that becomes your treasure. And the Bible says, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And that's where the enemy is coming. And there's a lot of people say, oh, the devil is tempting me. No, it ain't the devil. It's your heart. It is your heart that has made you vulnerable. Do y'all remember the story of Abraham and Lot? As long as they were together, they prospered. They grew. They was multiplied. They were blessed. They were protected. But as soon as they separate, it showed the condition of Abraham's heart and it showed the condition of Lot's heart. Lot's heart was drawn towards Sodom and Gomorrah. In essence, Lot's heart was drawn to the things of this world, the fancies of this world, the abundance of this world. Listen, we're all human, right? So we love having our family together. We love being our loved ones. We love protecting our children. We love watching them grow. We love falling into love and getting married. And we love all these things, having children and getting jobs. We love all those things. We love these things, right? We love these things. That's good. But once you are born again, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What is the new? The new is, the Bible says, set your affections on things above and not on things beneath or of this earth. He said, because things beneath has moth, has rust, has thief, corrosion, things above doesn't, there's no devil in hell that can touch what is above. There's no devil in hell that can touch what is above. But the devil in hell, the Bible says, not Rodney, but the Bible says he's the God of this world. Lowercase g, God of this world. He says, if our gospel be hidden, it is hidden to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded their minds, lest they would see the glorious light and be converted. So the God of this world, he can touch anything in this world. Do y'all remember when Satan was tempting Jesus in the wilderness? What did he tell them? He told Jesus, he says, I want you to bow down and worship me. He says, because he says, everything, all the kingdoms of this world, I'll give to you. He said, because the kingdoms of this world, everything in this world, the kingdom, the strongholds of this world, he says, it's been given to me. And he says, and I can give it to whomever I want. Satan can give position and Satan can give titles to anybody. That's why when I see believers who are in love with money and promotion and people who are in love with power and position and, and, and titles and people that are in love with it, you're the greatest, uh, a weak, you're the weakest one in, in the enemy's camp because the enemy can mess you up. The enemy can mess you up because he knows that in our humanity, we like good clothes. He knows we like um, jewelry. He knows we like money. Come on now. When you got money in your pocket, you feel good. When you can walk into the store and buy whatever you want, you feel good. When you can walk into that car dealership and you don't need no co-signer, co you feel good. When you walk and see a house and say, I want that house. Y'all remember when we were kids and driving around the car? We was driving around the car and we see another car. That's my 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 car. Come on. We learned this from children. That's my house. That's my house. Some of y'all are adults and y'all walk into a house and you go there every day touching it. Oh, this is my house. Thank you, Lord, for my house. Thank you, Lord, for my house. Satan knows you want that stuff. And so Satan says, I'll give it to you. And so there's a lot of people who got apartments, got houses, you got co-signers and you think it was Jesus. It wasn't Jesus. It was the devil. It was the devil that gave you that stuff because now that stuff has got you so confused. That stuff has got you so busy. That stuff has got you so wrapped up, tied up, shackled up, bound up, uh, entangled. That stuff has got you so concerned. Every time you hear an alarm, you jump out your bed in the middle of the night. You might be bowing on your knees praying and God is telling you to enter into his courts with thanksgiving and you're worshiping and then all of a sudden the enemy let your car alarm turn on and your car 
alarm turns on and you jump out of bed because, oh my God, somebody's about to steal my brand new car. And you jump out of your bed, you didn't realize that all the devil wanted you to do is to stop praying. All he wanted you to do is stop pressing, stop pressing into the kingdom of God. All he wanted you to do is take your hands off the altar. Oh no, you can't go to church. Why? Because the gas man now has the guy to come and check your meter on Sunday. Oh no, you can't go to church on Wednesday because why? You got to work that overtime to pay for that house. Oh my God. And you keep saying God gave it to you. I'm here to tell you by the power of the Holy Ghost, God didn't give you nothing because God is not going to give you anything that's going to cause you to turn away from him. God is not going to give you anything that caused you to be less faithful and less focused and less true in him. Listen, let me tell you something. There's a lot of people that your house is so confused. My God, you would be better off leaving that house and going and living into a shelter. You would be better off sleeping on somebody's couch than being in your king size bed with all those knuckleheads that you have allowed to be in your house that got every spirit in the world coming into your your house, got every demon of hell come into your house, bring in their music, bring in their junk, bring in their spirits, bring in their aura, bring in their confusion in your house. And you sitting there talking about, oh God, y'all pray for me because I got all this spiritual warfare in my house. No, you got ignorance in your brain. You got ignorance in your brain. Yes, I said it. You got ignorance in your brain because the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. Paris because of lack of knowledge. Amen to China. To China's, I'm sorry. Amen. Not in my house either. I had a best friend. One of my best friends used to come to my house and we would talk and hang out and, and, and share and share what was going on in his life and share what was going on in my life. And one day, this man thought it wise enough to, because he was aggravated, to cuss me out in my own house. And I, and I gave him warning. I said, I've never talked to you in that manner. You've never talked to me in that manner. And you will not talk to me in that manner any further. So I'm going to ask you to refrain from talking that language in my house. He said it again. So I told him, I said, you got a choice. You got a choice to put on, because you can't wear shoes in my house. So I said, you got a choice to put on your shoes and walk out the door. Or you got a choice of figuring out how you're going to land out that window. But you're leaving here. And I said, and you will never be allowed in my house until you respect whose house this is. Not my house. It's God's house. There's a certain thing that goes on in this house and there's a certain thing that does not go on in this house. And my friends, you who have allowed them because, oh, that's my, that's my child. Oh, that's my boo-boo. That's my little, my little sugar booger. That's my little uh, toe jam. Oh, that's my, your little toe jam is 35 years old. When are you going to open your eyes and see that the devil don't need to mess with you? All he needs to do is keep them in bondage. Because your heart is connected to them. And because your heart is connected to them, they have blinded you. Isaiah chapter 6, in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. High and lifted up in his train, filled the temple. His glory filled the temple. It is important to know that Uzziah had to die before Isaiah could even see the Lord. And too many people got too many gods before God. Too many people you honor, even Eli, the high priest, God destroyed him because he says, you honor your sons above me. And there's too many people that honor their children, that honor their marriage, that honor everything before God. God must be first. Listen, you want to see spiritual warfare? Put God first. Put God first. And that person that tell you, I love you, will curse you to your face. That person that says, I birth you in this world, will curse you to your face. You put God first, and you're going to see how the enemy is going to mess with every single person you love. 
So before we can talk about spiritual, before we can talk about spiritual warfare, before we can talk about spiritual warfare, what we need to talk about is what is it you love? What do you love? Or as the commercial said, who do you love? What do you love? Who do you love? What makes you feel happy? That's going to be the area of your temptation. That's going to be the area that the enemy is working through. So if your coworker that's getting on your nerve doesn't make you happy, the enemy ain't using them. That's God using them to show you you, to show you your flaws, to show you your weaknesses. That is God using them to show you where you need to work on. You know, for those of you who are about to enter into Sabbath and enter into fasting and praying and entering into a new season in Christ, for those of you about to enter into it, you must strip yourself of everything that you consider to be your own. When you go down in fasting, this is not about you getting power. This is about you becoming weaker. This is about you becoming more dependent upon God. This is about you uh, uh, laying at the altar everything, not for you to become emboldened with your humanity and your pride and your arrogance. No, this is for you. L listen, listen. You know, I know many of you might be saying, no, no, pastor. Um, no, um, I'm, I'm fasting so that I might get stronger in God. I'm fasting so that I might, you know, um, experience the fullness of God. I'm fasting so that I might um, feel his power. Okay, so turn with me to Isaiah 58. Isaiah chapter 58. And we're going to start reading from verse 3. And we're going to read down to verse, wow, we could actually read the whole thing. But let's, let's read down. Start from verse 3. Isaiah chapter 58. Glory to his name. Bless your name, Holy Father. Uh, Isaiah chapter 58, verse 3. Look at what it says. It says, why have we fasted, they say, and you, God, have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? He says, in fact... In the day, look at what he says, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife, for debate, and to strike with the fist of wickedness. He says, you will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Okay? To make your voice heard on high. He says, is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? He says, will you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Look what he says in verse 6. Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness? To undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry that you and that you bring into to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. He says in verse 8, he says, then, then, then. Here's the, here is the, 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 the other side of the coin. Here is the prerequisite. Here is the prerequisite is that you share your bread with the hungry, that you bring the poor into your house, that you see the naked, you cover him, that you hide not yourself from your own flesh, that you undo heavy burdens, that you pray for somebody else. Don't pray for no house. Don't pray for no car. Don't fast for no, no ministry that, oh God, I want a new building. Oh, God, I want more members. Oh, God, I'm fasting so I might get married. No, no, no. This is not for you. A fast is not for you. A fast is for God's purposes. You deny yourself for God's purposes. So you don't just turn your plate over. No, you turn your plate over to somebody else. 
You turn your, you deny yourself for somebody else. This is true kingdom work. This is true if you want to have power in your life. And if you want to really go into warfare, you got to deny yourself. So when you deny yourself, it's my house, it's my car, deny yourself. Give somebody else the car. Give somebody else your couch, your bed. Get out of your bed for somebody else. Not just for your family, not just for your friends, not just for your loved ones. Why? Because the Bible says too many of us, we do for saints and that's good. The Bible says do good unto all men, but especially those of the household of faith. However, too many of us think that because we're doing for saints, we're doing the work of the Lord. No, the work of the Lord, Christ said, he says, I did not come to save the righteous, but I came to save those who are sick. I came because those who are well don't need a physician. So the problem is we are, and I'm going to say it, people of God, I'm going to say it. The problem is we're making a whole lot of spoil, weak powerless children of God because you got saints crying unto saints and saints helping saints and saints getting help from saints and back and forth until nobody knows how to stand on their own two feet. So what devil can you fight? What devil can you fight? Now, yes, you are your brother's keeper. Yes, you are. You are your brother's keeper, but understand this. The gospel has been given unto us to go into a dark world, a dark world, to go into the crack houses, the whorehouses, to go into the prisons, to go into the, the street corners and the alleyways where they're shooting up, to go in there and to snatch those souls out of darkness to tell them, no, I'm going to walk you through this thing. I'm going to walk you through your addiction. Um, why? Why can you do it? Because some of you were addicted. Some of you were prostitutes. Some of you were adulterers. Some of you were thieves. Some of you were in prison. And so when you were in prison, you know the mindset. So God tells you, as he has done to, to you, you should go and do for somebody else. So that means you got to leave this selfish way of thinking where all you want to do is see saints <laughs> applauding you. All you want to do is see people of God saying, girl, you really bless me. Oh, God, that was such an anointed word of God. No, you need the people who are lost mm, to see the light of Jesus Christ. You need that stench person to come in your presence and you love them so much until you don't even smell their smell anymore. You love them to life. This is why so many of us are not encountering true spiritual warfare. Because of the fact of that we're not in the battle of Christ. We're in the battle of for our own lives. The Bible says, all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's all that's in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. What is the pride of life? The pride of life, because we know what the lust of the flesh is, is anything that you crave, anything that you desire. We know that the lust of the eyes are, the lust of the eyes are covetousness, desire for something that you see and that you want for yourself. Right. But the lust of the flesh could be eating. It could be drinking. The lust of the flesh could be um, making your body look sexy. The lust of the flesh may be to you using your body to try to get a man or you using your body to try to get a woman. The lust of the body is all these things, the things that you use your body to do to get your way. OK, um, the, the pride of life is when you have a certain idea of what your life is looks like that's satisfactory and you work diligently to get that life right you you work god bless you god bless you from florida god bless you we're praying for you we're praying that the lord would cover and protect and keep you if you if you can get out of florida get out of florida but if you can't we're, we're praying for you that god would watch over you but make sure your soul is right with god 
make sure your soul is right with God. Okay? So, the pride of life is when we have a picture of what my life is to be. You know, whatever you say, you might say, well, oh, I wanted to be married by such and such an age. I want to be retired by such and such an age. God bless you, Shanti. God bless you. I want to be, um, I want to be wealthy by such and such an age. I want to accomplish and get my degree. I want to get th those, those prides, those things, those things of life. Because here's the thing. Think about this. The Bible says, and the word of God teaches us in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says that everything that man pursues in this life, that's of this life, is vanity. And, and we don't really understand that. When you read the, the entire book of Ecclesiastes, you find that he talks about everything. He talks about education. He says it's vain. He talks about materialism. It's vain. He talks about marriage. Vain. He talks about having children. Vain. He talks about all these different things that we promote in our hearts. That these things are important to us. And so what happened, God bless you, Shanti. Glory to his name. Yes, glory to his name. Bless her father in the name of Jesus. Okay, so um, he knows that these things are good. You know, some of these things are good. Having children are good. Having, having a husband and a wife is good, is great. You know, um, because I tell everybody, uh, the marriage that God has ordained is the next thing to heaven. Um, but the marriage that you have put together is the closest thing to hell. Um, so I'm going to leave that with y'all to think about. Okay? So when we look at these things, having children is wonderful. Getting a promotion, wonderful. God bless you. He says, beloved, I pray that um, above all things that you prosper, even as your soul prospers, right? That you be in health and prosper, right? So God wants you to prosper. God wants you to be successful. That's why he says in Psalms chapter one, he says, but the man who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates in his law both day and night, that man shall be like a tree planted by the living rivers of water, whose leaf shall come out in due season, and everything he does shall prosper. So God wants us to prosper. He says he will make you the head and not the tail, right? He will, he will, he will give you the desires of your heart, right? So all those things are good. But my friends, it is not the desire that makes it bad. It's the love. It's the love of those things. The love of those things. When you, the, the Bible says the only thing we have authority to say is if the Lord's will, I will do such and such or I will go such and such. So if it's the Lord's will, I will raise my children in the knowledge of God and they're going to serve him. If the Lord's will, I will get married. If the, and you're not going to put a time in it because remember the word of God says dates and times are in the father's hands. Okay. Our times are in his hands. So you don't put a date on it. If the Lord's will, I'll do this. If the Lord's will, I'll go here. If the Lord's will, I'll accomplish that. Because he says anything outside of that is sin. Because when you say, I'm going to get this in four years. Now, your flesh starts to do everything that it needs to do. And your flesh, as you get to that four-year anniversary, your flesh easily gets frustrated because you're not there. Okay? That's why many times, some of you ladies, when you said, I'm going to be married by the time I'm 30. And here you are 38 or 40 or 45. And then also you're talking about your biological clock ticking. This is why you get frustrated. Because you had a plan outside of God's plan. You had a plan and you tried to give God your timetable. And, and you could be Sarah. God may wait until you 90 to bless you. God may not bless you at all because he says many more are the children of the barren than those who gave birth. So God may not bless you with children at all. And so when we start to put time on things, 
that's when our flesh get involved, our pride gets involved, because then if we come to that date and we didn't accomplish it, now we're frustrated. Now we find anxiety. Now we find frustration and aggravation. It's not the devil. It's what your heart calls for you to fall into. The devil ain't doing nothing to you. That's why the Bible says when we see the true devil at the end, he says that we're going to say, is that the one that deceived the nation? And, and the words sort of give this, this connotation of he's insignificant. For the Bible says all of the power in heaven and earth, Christ says, is in my hands. And guess what? Your hands is not the strongest part of your body. And we are the body of Christ. So the weakest part of the body with so many different components and joints and places that can get pulled and, and get, get hurt and, and can get offended and can get cold and, and, and can get, get cut, right? That place, right, is where all God's power is. So if the power was in Christ's hands and we are the body of Christ, my God, you got more power than you think you have. And so the devil is not going to willy-nilly just keep messing with you. What it is, is that oftentimes what people call warfare is not warfare. It's the, the, their heart and what their heart loves. And God is trying to get you to hate that thing so that you will love him once again. Some of you had too much confidence in your ex. You had too much confidence in your relationship. And God saw the condition of your heart. God saw the condition of what your heart would be if he was to allow that relationship to continue. And so what God did is that he allowed that relationship or sometime in some cases, God commanded that relationship to end. But he, he knew the condition of their heart. He knew the condition of your heart. This is why people of God, some of you ladies and men out there, this is why God didn't let you see or let you truly believe that they were cheating on you. God didn't let you see it because he knew that if you see it, you would do all that you could do to fix it. And if you could fix it, you would still be in it. And that thing would now become a God to you. And so God, what he did, he allowed for some of these relationships that we have connected ourselves into. He has allowed those things to, to separate. Oh, yes, it was painful. Oh, yes, it hurt. Oh, yes, it brought you, for some of you, it brought you to a place where maybe you didn't want to live. Maybe you didn't want to, maybe you didn't want to, you didn't want to be in this earth no more. You didn't want to be in this realm anymore. Maybe you was, was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Maybe you lost your faith. And maybe you say, well, I don't know if I'll ever love again. And God says, now I can talk to you. Now I can talk to you. Now I can I got your attention. Now you're not distracted by those things because now you're all alone. You tried to call Boo. You tried to call Tyrone. You tried to call, uh, I'm sorry, Amanda. I know your husband's name is Tyrone, but I'm talking about the proverbial Tyrone. Uh, you tried to call Tyrone. You tried to call your Boo, your Bay, your sugar daddy, your sugar mama. You tried to call them hoping that they would come to you. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that at least a prostitute gets paid for her prostitution. There's a whole lot of people that's been trying to prostitute themselves all the while, all, only trying to get somebody's attention because they feel lonely. You've been prostituting yourself and going out there. This is why God is not speaking to you. This is why God is not allowing you to accomplish the things that you know in your heart you're supposed to accomplish. Why? Because you're not ready for the battle in that area. Because as soon as you step into putting your hands to the altar, as soon as you step into getting from your knees and going out and launching out into the deep, that's where you find the sharks. That's where you find the barracudas. That's where you find the heavier waves and the winds and the storms and the dark nights and the, the, cloud, the, the, the cloudy skies. That's where you find all the junk. Not in the kiddie pool. Because see, when you're in the kiddie pool and the storm comes, your mother can come and say, come on, boo, come out the water. And you run out the water and you go into your house or into your shelter or into the car and you go and escape from the storm. But when you're in the deep water, 
and that storm comes, you got to now, you can't run from the storm. You can't run from the storm no more, but you got to turn that ship into the storm. And you got to understand how this storm works. You got to understand what this storm is coming to accomplish. And you got to know, just like Jesus told the disciples, when he told the disciples, he says, let us, let us go to the other side. And then he went into the boat. He went into the boat and Jesus fell asleep. Why did he fall asleep? Because we weren't at the other side yet. And the disciples in the midst of the sea, they wasn't at the other side yet. In the midst of the sea, a storm came and they got so afraid and they came downstairs and found Jesus sleeping. And when they found Jesus, sleeping, they said, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? Some of y'all have been complaining and dialing 911 and God says, I gave you all the tools you need and heaven has been silent. You've been calling now with God, help me. Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, help me. And the Bible says he has blessed you with all spiritual blessing already. You have the power of the Holy Ghost in you. You need to learn how to mature and to turn that ship into the storm. You need to turn it because you're in deep water now. You're not in the kiddie pool no more. You're not in the shallow water. You don't got a little float sea around you. You don't have the little uh, 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 inner tube around you. No, 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 no. You're in the ocean and you got to face all of the fears. You got to face all of your trouble. You got to face all of your naysayers. You got to face all of them and you got to know that God has given me a purpose and this purpose must go forth in spite of the haters, in spite of the naysayers, in spite of the people that want to dog me out, in spite of the people that want to curse me out. I got to turn this ship into the wind, into the storm, and I got to move forward. That's when you'll see warfare. That's when you'll see the wind increasing against your bow. That's when you'll see the devil slamming waves against you because he's trying to, he's trying to inject in you fear, worry, and flesh means of fixing it. He wants to get you off the altar like Nehemiah. He tell you, hey, Nehemiah, come on down. Let's have a conversation we want to talk about this thing and see how we can help you. Nehemiah had to say, no, I'm not coming down from the wall. This is my purpose. This is my plan. This is what God has given me to do. I'm not coming down from the wall. And sometimes, even when we're doing the video, we'll have people that'll be interjecting foolish talk and foolish stuff. Sometimes you got to ignore that stuff. And then if they're becoming really distracted, where they're not distracting you. Like the other day, we had somebody on the line and this person wasn't distracting me, but I started seeing the saints, the people of God. I started seeing them commenting at him, commenting at the person and quipping back at the person and quipping back at the person. So at that point, I gave the person one more opportunity to be obedient. And once they wouldn't be obedient, block. I blocked them. Why? Not because they were distracting to me, because my purpose was clear. My purpose was clear. My message was clear. My message was focused. I wouldn't allow them to throw me off, but I started seeing them throw the saints off. When I see them throw the saints off and I saw that there were some sinners that were watching and was repenting of their sins and coming into the kingdom, I noticed that this devil was trying to be distracting to them. So listen, don't run from it and don't step down out of the battle to talk with them because you can't counsel a demon and you can't cast out a, a bad habit. You got to curse that demon and sometimes you got to just block them. Don't even worry about it. Don't fuss about it. Don't throw the people off the point. Don't throw, don't make them the point because they're not the point. God gave you a purpose. God gave you a, a purpose. He gave you a directive. God gave you an assignment and you must stay on course. And when you stay on course for God, that's when warfare comes. Warfare is not what, 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 <laughs> My God, help me, Holy Spirit. Warfare is not what the devil is doing 
to your unregenerated children. Do y'all hear me? Warfare is not what the devil is doing to your unregenerated children or unregenerated family members or unregenerated friends. No, that's not warfare. Why? Because you either belong to God or you belong to Satan. And the Bible says Satan knows his own, just like God knows his own. Satan is not attacking the ones that he already has. People of God, open your eyes. You talking about, oh, that devil trying to keep my child addicted? No. Your child's desire to get high is keeping them addicted. My God. Listen, I'm, let, me, let me do a sidebar real quick. I'm telling y'all right now, those of you who are coming to the Power One Conference in October, the 20th through the 22nd, my God. You think this is something. Wait until we get together into one place. It might be in another Azusa Street. It might be an outpouring that will shake the foundations of Virginia completely. I'm telling you, you need to register today. You need to register today. You need to get yourself there. You need to come there with a prayerful heart. Come there with a humble spirit. I'm telling you, God is, this is a season and it is time. Time is winding up. It is time for us to lock ourselves into our Heavenly Father. I'm telling you, you don't want to miss it. So you can go to my page, www.41vision.com, or you can go to my Facebook page and you can register. Um, and maybe Sister Trisha or Angie will post our um, website and, and post the information. But I'm telling you, you need to be there, right? But, but here's the point. We, um, warfare is not the enemy. Thank you, Trisha. Warfare is not the enemy messing with his own. The enemy don't mess with his own. Because he already have them. There's no point. Even Christ said, if Satan is divided against his own self or his own purposes, his kingdom cannot stand. So Satan ain't messing with your unsaved child. It's the desires and the sinful nature of your unsaved child or your unsaved husband or your unsaved wife or your unsaved mother or your unsaved father. It is their desires for the things of this world that is keeping them wrapped up. And you need to understand that. So every time you keep fighting the devil, the devil's like, who are they talking about? They ain't talking about me because I ain't touching them. And that's why you don't see deliverance. You don't see deliverance because you keep blaming the devil for their stuff instead of blaming them and their own desires. The Bible says, let no man say in the book of James, and let's turn there real quick. And keep your finger on Isaiah uh, 58 because we're going to go back there. Isaiah 58. James, the first chapter, and uh, verse 13 to 15. 13 to 15, J James, the first chapter, verse 13 to 15. Look at what it says. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But verse 14, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desires have conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So these are the things that you tell your children. Not that the devil is doing it. No. Tell your children, your desire for the things of this world is going to kill you. Your desire for the things of this life is going to destroy you. Your desire for drugs and alcohol is going to destroy you. Stop, stop babying them. Stop thinking that, oh, the devil went there and went to the drug house and got the weed, and the devil 
went and got the paper and the devil sprinkled the weed in the paper and the devil lit the paper and wrapped it up and the devil broke out his lighter and lit it and the devil inhaled that smoke and the devil held that smoke inside. Are y'all hearing me tonight? It's not the devil. It's the desires of that child. It's the desires of that man, that woman, that boy, that girl. It is the desires. Satan is only a tempter. He tempts you by your desires. He tempts you by your desires. You want to have a child. You want to have a child. You want to have a baby. You want to have a child. Okay, God knows that's your desire. And so, you know, you go and you're not married. So you're like, oh, I want to have a child. And I want to have, I'm going to get married and I want to have a child. You're not married. You don't have a child. And you're sitting there saying, I want to get married. But then you look at your years are going by. Then you go to that unrighteous doctor. And that unrighteous doctor says, girl, how old are you? And you ain't married yet? Listen, you better store your eggs because you ain't going to be able to have children. He plants that in your spirit. Then you come home. You come home and the devil start telling you, listen, look at that. Look at that guy. That guy likes you. That guy likes you. you he looks cute too. And all of a sudden that, you start hooking up with him. And then all of a sudden the enemy starts desensitizing you, desensitizing you with his cunning craftiness desensitizing you. And now you, the believer, has now made up your mind because marriage is taking too long. I might as well have a baby now. Now you have that baby and you can't focus on worship because you got your ears to their nose listening to see if they're breathing. Now you can't pray because as soon as you bow on your knees to pray, your child goes, mommy, I need you. And you get off your knees and run. And then you lay in the bed with them. And as you're trying to pray, they're snuggling up to you and they're moving. And you can't pray. You can't lock yourself in because you're still, you're still reminiscing and thinking about that child. The Bible told in the story of Job, it says, On the day that the sons of God came to present themselves to God, Satan was in the midst of them. So there it is. The devil is now using your desires against you. Your desires for that child. Your desires for that marriage. Your desire. So now you can't find a good man or good woman. So now you settle for a piece of man or a piece of woman. You can't find a man in the church. So now you find a man in the mosque. You can't find a man that saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. But now you marry a man or a woman that has a homosexual or lesbian spirit. And because your desires has tempted you to advance God, to not wait on the Lord and be of good courage, to not know that God says, I'll supply all your needs according to his riches and glory, which means God says before a thought comes to your mind, he knows it all together. So that means if God did not give me certain things that I desire is because although I desire it, now is not the time. Yes. Yes, Roger. You're absolutely right. Now is not the time. If you trust in the Lord, Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And don't lean on your own understanding of how things are supposed to work. But in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Listen, if God, if you have a desire for children, let me help y'all. Oh my God, I don't know why the Holy Spirit is on this. And maybe that's because there are many of you, male and female, that's thinking about children. Maybe you have children issues, okay? But the Holy Spirit is leading in, this, leading in this area. And so I want to share this with you. If you have a desire for children or for your own children, 
then you must be a lover of children, not just your own. Which means, if your children don't want you to be their mommy or their daddy, they want to do their own thing, then let them go and do their own thing. There's a billion other children in the world who wish they had a mommy, who wish they had a daddy. Be a mother or father to everyone. Be a mother or father to that single single parent. Not, not for lustful means. Not for desire, not for relationship. But be there because you genuinely love children. Because you genuinely want to see the children grow. And accept them as your own. Christ says, here's the kingdom of God. Who are my brothers? Who is my mother? Even further, who are my children? But those that do the will of my father. Because two can't walk together unless they agree. This is why there's confusion in your house. Because you, the saved one, is trying to walk with a demonic child. You, the saved one, is trying to keep peace in a home with demonic people. That's why there's confusion in your house. The devil didn't bring confusion. You brought them in. See, the kingdom of God is so different than the things of this world. Too many people think they want the kingdom of God, but you don't know what you're asking for. The Bible says, let every man count the cost. You got to count the cost. There's a cost associated with following Christ. And the scripture says, what does it profit you to gain everything in this world and to lose your soul? What does it profit you? What shall you give in exchange for your soul? So the fact that God has called me, the fact that God has chosen me to step out of darkness and into his marvelous light means that God has called me because remember, it's just like a marriage, right? Adam said, for this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. When you come into the kingdom of God, it's just like a marriage, you have to leave something and now cleave to something else. So that means you got to now leave everything of this world. You got to leave it. What do I mean by leave it? You can't walk away from it because, listen, some of you got children that are babies. You can't walk away from it. You can't say, okay, put your baby in a box and put him in the middle of the street. You're on your own. No, you can't do that. You can't, you know, many of you, if you're married, you can't go to your husband, take up your ring and you're on your own. No, you can't do that. Right? But what does it mean to leave? It means your love for it. Because just like a man, when a man gets married, he doesn't leave his mother and father like he's no longer their son. No, he's always their son. And she's always the daughter of her parents. But what is the leaving and the cleaving? The leaving and the cleaving is a leaving of the love. And for some of you, that's why you haven't gotten married yet. It's because you still love your mama and your daddy. You got such a great love for them that anyone who comes into your life has got to submit under their authority. And that will bring confusion in your house. Some of you got so much love for your children. And so if you're a woman and you got great love for your son then you will cause for there to be discord in your marriage because your love for your son is greater than your love for God. And so God is not going to mess over the man who has found favor in his sight and give him to you so that you can make him a slave to everybody that you love. And the same thing goes for women or men for women as well. So if that man is so uh, connected to his mama or so connected to himself or his job, then God is not going to give him that wonderful blessed woman because he will enslave her under the same bondage that he himself is enslaved. If the blind lead the blind, they both fall into the ditch. That's why the word of God says when you get married, you become one. And so many people say, oh, when I get married, then I'm going to drop that. That's when I say the devil is a liar because of the fact of that you're not what you're going to do is what you have formed a habit to do unless God truly transforms you. 
And that is wishful thinking. Because if ladies, if you're going to use that excuse and say, oh, uh, when I get married, then I'm going to drop all this. Okay, then let the man tell you, when I get married, then I'll get a job. Okay, if y'all want to, if y'all want to talk real, if y'all want to talk real, if y'all want to, if y'all want to get down to the nitty and gritty, the man may tell you, well, baby, I know I got three and four and five girlfriends, but when I marry you, I'm going to let them go. But until I marry you, I'm, I'm just going to hold on to this. But don't worry, when I marry you, I'm going to be dedicated to you. The devil is a liar. When you're single, when you're unmarried, it is about preparing for to become that person before you walk into that realm. That's why when David was anointed, before he got into the palace, he was already anointed to be king. He was a king while he was in the wilderness. He was a king while he was taking care of sheep. That's why the Bible says, he who finds a wife, not a woman, not he who finds a woman, he who finds a wife, finds a good thing and finds favor of the Lord. So it's about um, becoming that which you are now. And so warfare is about, and we may have to do a part three. We, we, and as a matter of fact, we're going to do a part three, a part three and continue on this topic of warfare. Because I want to get into um, uh, what to do if you are in spiritual warfare. Tonight, we were talking more about identifying whether or not you are in warfare, right? Um, ident identifying whether or not you are truly in warfare. Um, because a lot of people, this is why you don't find the power that God has promised you. You don't find the power that God has promised you because what you think is war is not war. It's nothing but something to kill your flesh. Stephen was stoned. And I'm sure the stones that he was stoned with was big enough and hard enough to kill him. But the stones was not war. The stones killed his flesh but released his spirit. My God, wait till I break that down for y'all. The stones killed his flesh, but released his spirit. I'll give you another example so you can study ahead of time so we can talk. The Holy Spirit can confirm what he reveals to you in these passages. The same thing happened with John. John, they thought to use boiling oil to boil him in, and they thought that that was going to kill him. No, the boiling oil and him being exiled on the Isle of Patmos killed his flesh. For he says, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. Peter being crucified upside down didn't kill his flesh. It released his spirit. That's why Paul says, it is better for me to depart. Because if you, if you take out this flesh, the word of God says, don't feel, fear the man who can kill this flesh. But fear the one who, after he killed this flesh, can cast your soul in hell. So what can man do to you? Nothing. So all the stuff that you're talking about, oh, they just making me upset. They just bother me. They just getting on my nerve. No. You need to stop arguing with them. Stop fighting with them. And tell them, thank you. Because by their methods, they've been causing your flesh to become disturbed. Now, you want to enter into warfare? This is what you do. Instead of worrying about what they're saying, worry about, worry about what's coming out of you. The word of God says, what goes into a man or woman doesn't defile you. It's what comes out of you. What comes out of you defiles you. So when that person said what they said, when that person did what they did, what came out of you? Fear? What came out of you? Anger? What came out of you? Wrath? What came out of you? 
Fighting? What came out of you? Jealousy? When that man that you liked was looking at somebody else, did jealousy come out of you? Did envy come out of you because he was laughing or she was laughing at their jokes, but they didn't laugh that same way at your jokes? That they would prefer to spend more time with them than with you? Did that bother you? That's God telling you. Look at what's in your flesh. Look at, look at the area that you need to submit to me. Look at the area you need to let me in. But too many of us, we see those things as, no, if, if I acknowledge those things, that means I'm weak. Okay. So, if you feel that way, then now acknowledge your pride. Acknowledge, yes, if cursing, Fred, Fred, Frederica, that's right. I acknowledge if you've been cursing. What came out of you? That's why I thank my haters. When, when, they, when they push me to a way, and, and sometimes, I'm, I'm going to be real with y'all. Listen, I'm not no fake preacher. I'm not no fake teacher. I'm not no fake man of God. No, I'm not sitting here telling you that I'm always on the mountaintop. No, there's sometimes... I'm in the valley. There's sometimes I want to hip toss a few people in front of Jesus. There's sometimes I want to choke somebody. There's sometimes that somebody cut me off in traffic and give me the finger and I drive up next to them like, if I could jump out this car and slap you on both sides of your face, I would. Right? Um, and then sometimes these things come out. And guess what? The Holy Spirit is right there. The Holy Spirit is right there to say, you see what just came out of you? Confess that. He said, because if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. When you start confessing, yeah, Lord, I didn't think I was jealous, Lord, but Lord, just now a little jealousy came out of me. God, I think I had control of my temper, but God, just now I blew up just now and I was blind. I wasn't listening. God, I, I closed my ears to everything. Like, oh, Lord, I thought I, I thought I forgave them, but Father... After what they said, I realized that I'm still harboring something in my heart. Listen, when you see stuff like that, that's not warfare. That's God helping you. That's your welfare. Not your warfare. That's your welfare. And there's a difference between spiritual welfare and spiritual warfare. Spiritual welfare is God trying to help you through the spirit. He's trying to bring things your way to assist you until you stand on your feet because that's what welfare is for. Welfare is really designed, it's supposed to be designed, supposed to be designed to help you until you get on your feet. But most people would rather just stay on welfare. They would rather just say something and cuss and then, oh, Lord, please forgive me. And then next week, cuss again. Oh, Lord, please forgive me. And then next week, uh, tell somebody off. Oh, Lord, please forgive me. Yes, Valerie. Yes, the Holy Spirit will tell you. The Holy Spirit will tell you, be quiet. And you might say, but Lord, look at what they're saying. And the Holy Spirit is saying, be quiet. Because it is when you let patience have her perfecting work. That you will be complete and entire, lacking nothing. I told many of you, some of you are new to, to this Bible study, but I've told my testimony many times before. But um, my, my issue was anger, lust, and I didn't care about nobody but me, pride. And, you know, if you argued in my face, I was going to tell you one time back away. After that, we were fighting. My lust was out of control. My uh, uh, pride was out of control. Didn't want to lose. Didn't want to bow down. Didn't want to submit. Thought I was better than everybody else because I had this pride, this natural pride that came from my family. And then also I had this pride that also came you know, it's, it's a certain measure of spiritual pride that comes with Christ. When you know that I'm more than a conqueror. When you know that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. When you know like Paul, when he says, um, he says, uh, the devil finds nothing in me. Christ says, the devil finds nothing in me. 
Paul says, none of these things move me. That's a certain measure of pride, but it's spiritual pride. It's good pride. It's, it's for you to stand realizing that my source of strength is not me. It's not who I am. It's not my ability, but my source of strength is God. And so I can boast in the Lord. I can brag in the Lord. But when you start bragging in yourself, God got to show you. He got to show you through these little nuances. This is not warfare. This is welfare. Yes, Sharon, you're right about that. He, he will sometimes do that. He will sometimes twist your words to prevent you from saying something that you're not supposed to say. Yes. But then here's the interesting thing. Just because you didn't say it in your mouth, but if you said it up here in your brain, you already said it. And so once we realize that God is my source, then what we do is that we now submit ourselves to him. And then we look at circumstances, trials, and we look at difficulties differently. We look at them no longer from the eyes of, woe is me. Oh, I'm by myself. Nobody likes me and nobody cares for me and nobody supports me and nobody listens to me. No, we stop being babies. Nobody has to listen to you. That's why I, I consider it a privilege, a blessing for you all to be listening tonight. Nobody has to listen to you. But here's the key. If they listen to you, it is because God has allowed them to hear you. Christ says, no one can come unto me unless my Father draws them. So, when you look at people coming and they're coming at you, ask yourself this question. What's coming out of me? If wickedness is coming out of you, let me see, how do we get to let God, how, how do we get to let God to help us fix of whatever we're struggling with in this topic? Okay. All right. So how, I, I guess your question is, I, I believe your name is Sherry East. I believe. Sherry East. Riello. Okay. So how do you get to let God to help you fix of whatever you're struggling with in this topic. Okay, so how do you get God to help us fix it? The way you do it is that, remember, God has given you the source. And yes, Valerie, you're absolutely right. Um, it's about submitting. Um, it's submitting. How do you submit to God? A lot of people may not understand what it means to submit to God. What does it mean to submit to God? Listen, God has already detailed and outlined his perfect will. And then God also gave you through the word of God, not only his perfect will from Genesis to Revelation, but God also gave you an example in Christ to follow. God has also given you an example in, in the apostles. That's why the book of Acts is not called the book of Acts. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. So the word of God teaches us that when we study the word, right, everything that was written, the scripture said, was written for our learning. And if we can apply those things, then it's going to have impact in our lives. That's why the Word of God says that if you are hearers of the Word, but not doers of the Word, then it's not going to profit you anything. You're going to deceive your own self. So when you, you, like for example, if you have a problem with anger, if you have a problem with anger, you should be reading what the Word says about angry, about being angry. You should read everything that the Word of God says about anger. If you got a problem with lust, you should take a comprehensive study and read everything the Word of God has to say about lust. You're going to find people who did it the right way and what happened to them. You're going to find people that did it the wrong way and what happened to them. And then now it's up to you to make a choice. Which way will you follow? See, too often we put our attention on the people 
that's coming at us. Yes, Sharon, faith without works is dead. And yes, Andrea, you must surrender your heart and soul to the Lord. But I, I, the reason why I'm explaining to her and to you guys this way is because sometimes, because we have been, most of us, have been so used to speaking church language to church people who understand church people, sometimes the simplicities of the gospel, most people don't understand. Because we're talking, we're using terminologies and themes that goes beyond what their scope of understanding, or maybe even their spheres of what they've been using, like what, what knowledge they've been using. That's why I often tell people, you know, I went to school and, and I got my degrees, I got my papers, I got all my certificates, I got all that stuff like that, right? But, but here's the interesting thing, right? Me speaking Greek or Hebrew to people who understand English doesn't help them. Paul says, I would rather speak a few words with my understanding so that you can get an understanding than to speak in many words in a tongue, an unknown tongue. So this is why I try to break down. There's a lot of times believers will come on and they want me to get to the point. Why? Because you know where I'm going. The truth is in you. The Holy Spirit is in you. But for those who do not know, we must take the time to break it down. Secondly, if we break it down, it shows that we know what we're talking about. Because too often I've seen people quote certain scriptures and then I say, well, what does that mean? And they go, I don't know. Like, remember the rich young ruler? The rich young ruler says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you know the scriptures. He said, you already know the scriptures. He says, it says, love your neighbor yourself, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. He says, all those things I did. He said, all, keep those commandments. All those things I do. So I know that stuff. But he didn't know that he had to surrender his heart more than his wealth. And there's a lot of people that they wondering and they think that it's the devil that's destroying their household. And it's not the devil. Is that you allowed a worldly person who, if they are of this world, then their God, their Lord, their motivator, their instigator is Satan. So in essence... You, the believer, if you have this knowledge that I'm a believer, then you, the believer, you might as well go on the street and put a sign and say, Satan, you're welcome to come into my house. See, because you're still looking at your baby. That means you're a spirit-minded person, a spirit-minded person, but thank you, Janice. You're a spirit-minded person, but you are now looking at your child as your baby. And so, because it's your baby, you say, I'm not letting the devil in my house. I'm letting my baby in the house. And you think, because that baby came from your womb, that baby is safe. Not realizing that your greatest temptation will be that of your heart. And so what I would encourage you to do, for those of you who want to know how to break free of the things that you struggle with and how to let God deliver you from it, you must first understand what God said about it. Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I won't know what to do if I don't know what God said to do. And I'm not talking about getting a book, going to the bookstore and how to get your prayer through. No. Open the Bible. Open the Bible. Sit down with your Bible. You don't need no commentary. You just need a concordance. And look for that word. Whatever it is. Anger, jealousy, insecurity. Look for that word. And study, meditate on what the word says. And when the word gives you a command in that area, like when it says, put away anger, now your prayers become directed correctly. Instead of praying about your enemy at work, oh God, don't let them get on my nerve today. No, your prayers now, Lord, as I go to work and I see my coworker, Father, do not allow for anger to take over me, but allow your love 
to take over me. Go to work. Face that storm. Face that storm. Turn your boat into the storm. Face that storm and ride it out. If it's low self-esteem, and thank you for, um, for asking that. If it's low self-esteem, uh, one of the things you might look for is you may look for the words confidence. You may look for the words boldness. And on the negative side, you may look for the word fear. You may look for the words doubt. Because the only reason why a person has low self-esteem is because they don't have a true knowledge of who they are. Somebody has planted in that person a false knowledge. And usually, it's somebody who you love. Somebody you love, or maybe once loved, or once gave yourself to, or once lived your life for, or once you put a whole lot of stock, stock in them, that person you loved. Now, oh, praise the Lord. God bless you. Yeah, we're going to talk about that before we let you go. Um, so once you love that person, that person now gives you identity. Remember, it was Adam. When God brought Eve to Adam, it was Adam that gave Eve her identity and gave her her purpose. Adam said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of a man. And then he talked about her giving birth to children. He talked about that she will be, he called her Eve because he said she will be the mother of all living. And so Adam gave her purpose. So oftentimes the people who you are connected to, the people who you love, has the power to, to plant the seeds of knowledge in your, in your spirit. And so if they look down on you, or if they want you to be what they want you to be, and you're not happy with it, right? After a while, because of your love, you start to believe it. And then when you start to believe it, and now when they break your heart, now you have low self-esteem. Because now you don't know who you are. You don't know what, what to believe about you. You don't you if they told you you'll never find anybody better than me. Then you start to believe that. Now they're not in your life and you start to think, I'll never find anybody. There's nobody out there for me. That's where low self-esteem is. So what I would encourage you to do if you have low self-esteem, I would encourage you to study where the scripture says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Right? Read the scripture where, and, and, and I'll find it for you. I'll give it to you so that you will have that um, to study on. Because the Holy Spirit is telling me, yep, right there, right there. Um, you know, you, you, must, you must now reset. You must now reset your mind. Psalms 139. Okay. 139. And Psalms 139. Somebody please write this down. Psalms 139. For self and put put this for low self esteem, Psalms one thirty nine, verses thirteen. Verses thirteen to nineteen. And in fact, you could actually read the whole chapter, meditate upon the whole chapter. Of Psalms 139 um, if you have low self-esteem okay and for those of you who are struggling with lust if you're struggling with lust um, you can read uh, James and we we read it earlier this evening um, James chapter 1 James chapter 1, and I want you to meditate. I want you to meditate on verses 12. James chapter 1, from verse 12 to verse 15. And this is the, these scriptures are just one of many scriptures 
that you can use. Um, but um, yes, yes, Andrea, read it all. Tell them to read it all. Um, make sure you put in comments Psalms 139 um, for low self-esteem. James chapter 1, verses 12. Verses 12 to 15 for lust. God bless you, Valerie. Okay? And so there are um, so many other scriptures that you can um, read from. But, but simply, what you want to do is meditate on it. And then you want to, and what does it mean to meditate on it? Very simply, it means to, uh, what I would do if I was you, um, for those of you who are dealing with these various things, um, you must plant it in your subconscious. The Bible says, how can a young man cleanse his way? It says, by taking heed to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. For thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So in other words, it's the hiding of the word of God in your heart that gives you the victory over that sin. It's the hiding of the word. So when you take that word, whatever word it is, whatever issue you're going through, when you take that issue and you do a comprehensive study, what do I mean by that? I want you to get a pad. I want you to get a pencil. Don't use your computer. Don't use your laptop. Get a pad with a pencil or a pen. And I'm going to tell you why. Because some of the things that we have forgotten, we have forgotten how a person memorizes things. We memorize things by what we see, by what we hear, by what we experience through our five senses. We memorize things through repetition. And we re memorize things when we do things simultaneously with the same thing. Like, for example, if you want to remember someone's name, what you want to do is when they tell you a name, you want to repeat it in your mind, speak it out, type it on your phone, and then all you have to do is during that moment, constantly mention their name. So when you're talking to them, you might say, like, if you met me and I said, hi, my name is Rodney, you might say, Rodney, oh, Rodney, it's good to meet you. So Rodney, what do you do? Oh, so Rodney, you're a pastor. Oh, that's cool. So, Rodney, how do you do, when you do that, what you're doing is that you're making an indelible imprint in your subconscious, so when you see me, you're going to remember Rodney. The same thing with the Word of God. When you take the Word of God and you not only read it, but you write it down, when you write it down, this is your subconscious mind remembering everything you're writing. Then take it, post it on your refrigerator, post it on the mirror in your bathroom, post it in your car. When you start your car and you're warming your car, take that paper from off your visor, read it, read it again, okay? And then when you pray, pray concerning that word. If it says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and let's say you don't believe that, you're like, oh, I think I'm just status quo. Then know what you do? You pray. Father, I see your word saying that I am fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. But God, I don't feel that way. Help me to understand what you mean when you say that. See, when you do that, what happens is that the Holy Spirit and you are now engaged in the construction process of your upbuilding. The Holy Spirit is within you, and he, the Word of God says He will lead you and guide you into all truth. So you got to put it everywhere. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy, it says when you teach the Word of God to your children and even to yourself, it says you want to teach it to them when you get up, you want to teach it to them when you lie down. You want to teach it to them when you're at the table. You want to teach it to them when you get up from the table. You want to teach it to them when they go out the house. You want to teach it to them when they come in the house. You want to keep teaching it, keep Keep pressing it. Keep pushing it. Keep teaching it. Keep teaching it. Same thing with you. If you want to break free of any situation, if you're struggling with lust, your lust is not taking you over because that guy or that girl is so fine. No, your lust is not taking you over because you're so lonely. No, 
Your lust is overtaking you because you're watching lustful programs. You're listening to songs that talk about sex and lust. You're, you're having conversations with people about lust. You are uh, listening to gossip about lust, about people having an affair. You're going on your job and you're talking to your coworkers about lust. You're meditating about how it feels and um, how does it feel? You're, you're sitting there and you're thinking about all these different things. And because you're doing, you're imprinting in your spirit lust. You want to break free of it? Imprint the different stuff. Imprint the stuff that is against lust. Imprint what the word says the punishment for lust is. When you keep imprinting that, then now your spirit has the power to deny your flesh. Because your flesh is sinful. The Bible says, in this flesh dwells no good thing. So this flesh is sinful. And so while this flesh is sinful, and you trying to live, the only way you're going to live, the Bible says, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. So this is part two. We're going to go into part three. Um... I'm going to pray and ask the Lord if it's okay to do part three tomorrow. And so I'll let you guys know. Otherwise, then we probably won't meet again unless the Lord allows until Monday evening at 8 p.m. And so God bless you. I, we're going to go down in prayer right now. I thank you all for watching and listening. Um, please, uh, once again, if you are not registered for the Power of One conference, Please register today. Register today. We, we have a little bit more time. It's not until October 20th through the 22nd. Uh, we need folks to um, get your rooms. Get your rooms. Uh, you don't have to pay for your rooms right now, but you got to at least um, give them uh, your credit card information so they can secure your room because that takes one of the rooms off of our list of rooms that we have to fill. And so you're helping us out to bring order. So do it sooner than later. Um, make sure you register for the conference as quickly as possible. Um, I'm telling you, you are going to be blessed um, abundantly, and it's going to be life-changing. And so let us go down in prayer. I love you all in the name of our Lord. It's called the Power One Conference, by the way. Um, so I love you, and uh, I pray that you would go deeper in the word of God. Uh, thank you, Trisha, for posting that once again. Amen. And so let us pray in the name of Jesus. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for this time tonight, God, and we thank you for this opportunity and every person that thought it not robbery to join with us tonight. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would fill our hearts with more of you, that God, you would instruct us and bring us deeper into a better relationship with you so that, God, we may walk humbly and holy before you. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are watching and those who your spirit, the Holy Spirit, has ministered to our hearts tonight. And God, I pray that you would secure us in your presence. For you told us we are sealed, sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. And so, God, secure us. For you said, and this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life, and he who has not the Son of God has not life. So God bless us in the name of Jesus, that, Father, we might have life and life more abundantly. Forgive the sinner. Lord God, return the backslider in the name of Jesus and give us peace with you. We thank you, Father. And we glorify you. Father, we lift up the conference, the Power One Conference. We pray, God, that your, um, your spirit would fill the house. And that, God, you would destroy every work of the enemy. And that, God, you would give us favor. That you would open up windows and doors of opportunity. Bless those who desire to be there. That, God, they would be able to come. I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that you would make a way out of or no way. Cause them not to lie or waste their finances. But I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that they would be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as they know, their labor is not in vain in you. 
And Father, I pray that you would touch each and every one of us. That Father, as they come, I would be able to feed them the richness of your holy word through the power of your Holy Spirit and the lightning power of your word. Father, we thank you tonight and we give you glory, honor, and praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Kiana, I believe that's how you spell your name. God bless you. Valerie, God bless you. Janice, um, God bless you. Thank you. Allegra, God bless you. So you guys, you'll hear. Oh, thank you, Trisha, for my happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. God bless you, Mia. Mia, I love your name. Mia Judah Queen. I love that. Um, Veretta, God bless you. Sequela, God bless you. Taylor, uh, Valerie. Oh, God bless you, Valerie. Thank you for joining us on your first time. Sharon, God bless you. Naisha, Valerie, you, if you are a friend with me on, on Facebook, it'll tell you when we're on the next time. And so God bless you. Opo, God bless you. Amanda, Tanisha, God bless you. Denise, thank you for my happy birthday. I appreciate it. God bless you all. You know, it, it's a wonderful time, and I thank God. Andrea, God bless you. Thank you. You said, happy, beautiful pastor. I love it. <laughs> God bless you. Amen. Sheree, God bless you. Sheree, what do you mean rest well? I need to party. Lord, have mercy. I'm, I'm giving God praise for this, this day. And so, but yeah, I'm going to rest. Okay? God bless you. God bless you all. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to share this video. Well, I am not, Pastor. <laughs> God bless you. God bless you, Valerie. Thank you so much. Sequela, you're welcome. Please come again. T, God bless you. Thank you. Happy blessed birthday. Hallelujah. Thank you. Crystal, oh, God bless you, Crystal. Thank you. May God bless you for doing so. And may God continually bless and strengthen you as well. Sheree, you are funny. Tanisha, thank you, Tanisha. Love you, sis. Amen. Kiana, yes, yes, thank you. Kiana Nicole, God bless you. And Angela, Andrea, Kwanza, God bless you. Thank you so much. I appreciate your love, and I love Kingdom Keys Ministry as well. God bless you all. Um, Gwenita, Gwenita, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for the birthday wishes. Frederica. Frederica, I believe. Elizabeth, you're welcome. God bless you. Terry Garland, God bless you. Oh, man, you guys bless my heart. Amen. Give God all the glory. Thank you for sharing the video. Thank you. for Without him, I and we are nothing. Amen. And so we are only here in obedience to his word. God bless you, Kenya. Thank you so much. Edna, God bless you. Yes, I will continue to enjoy my birthday. God bless you. Thank you so much for your well wishes, everyone. I am humbled and, and appreciative of it. God bless you all. Amen. And so you guys have a blessed and marvelous evening. And look out for my uh, uh, invitation to the next study. Amen. Keisha, thank you so much. Keisha, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Rita, Oh, God bless you. Danville, Virginia. All right. That's all right. Rita, you might be close to our conference. I hope you're able to come. God bless you. Valerie. Oh, thank you, Valerie. I appreciate that. And I receive that in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. To God be the glory. Everything is for his glory. Everything is for his glory. Amen. All right, everyone. I wanted to be able to say goodnight to everyone. And so if nobody else is going to comment, I'm going to get ready to shut off. And so have a blessed, a blessed night. Wonderful weekend. God bless you, Edna. God bless you all. Hey, Chris from Rhode Island. Amen. God bless you. Chris, you know, I go out to Rhode Island all the time to fish. Oh, yeah, I go out there to fish a lot. Andrea. Thank you, Andrea. I appreciate you, too. Thank you, sister. Thank you for your kind words. I appreciate you. 
Thank you for sharing the video, Tanisha. Glory to his name. Thank you, Father. Lord, it just bless your word, Father. Bless your word. Good night, Valerie. Thank you. Have a great evening. You're welcome, Edna. God bless you. You're in Weka Pod. You know, Rhode Island got the strangest names, you know, but I go to, um, uh, what is it, Onset? Onset, I believe it's Onset. And then I go to, um, what is the other place? There's another place in Rhode Island that I go to and I fish on a six-pack um, boat. Um, it's a smaller boat, but uh, I go out there and I fish um, usually like once a month I'm out there. Um, and so God bless you. So every time I come to Rhode Island from now on, I'm going to send up a prayer for Chris. God bless you. And I think I've heard of week apart or, or, or I believe I heard of that in my travels. Amen. Vanita, I'm a first timer. Oh, God bless you. Thank you, Vanita, for, for coming. I appreciate it. I don't know how you found us, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, thank you for coming. Love you, Chris, as well. Thank you. Um, Opal, I need you in New Hampshire. <laughs> oh, God bless you. Then pray to our Heavenly Father, um, and the Lord will make a way out of nowhere. The Lord will make a way. And you know, in fact, Opal, I just came from New Hampshire fishing again. Y'all y'all hear this a lot. I fish everywhere. Um, hey, Cynthia from Hawaii. Guess what? I was in Hawaii too. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. It is a beautiful island. Oh my God, such a beautiful island. I loved it. I'm trying to think of the name of that mountain I went to that had that strong wind and had chickens all over the place. And I'm like, man, uh, 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 a black man in a place with nothing but chickens, I wouldn't have to go in the house. I could live outside and eat. And then the, I, was, I was really amazed how the wind was so strong blowing me, but then it wasn't blowing the chickens nowhere. I forgot the name of the mountain. It was the mountain where the king of Hawaii threw the, the, the soldiers over the cliff. And they got a strong wind. I can't think of the name of the mountain. Maybe you may know it. Amen. But God bless you, Cynthia. Thank you, Crystal, for sharing the video. I appreciate you. God bless you. Eddie Robinson. God bless Atlanta. Eddie, I used to live in Decatur, Georgia. I used to live in Decatur. God bless you. Oh, yes, Chris. Yes, yes. I have shirts and stuff like that that when I go fishing, I put on my shirt that says Fisher of Men. Um... You know, because that's really my first love. My first love is is preaching and teaching the gospel of, of Christ. That's my first love. And and then, you know, the second thing that I love to do, because it allows me to spend time in the presence of God. And I don't think about nothing. I don't talk to nobody unless the Lord leads me to minister to someone. But I spend time fishing and praying. And, and God has blessed me to be very successful. But um, I was telling one of our sisters... Um, it was from um, Opel from New Hampshire that I just came from New Hampshire fishing for uh, whiting and ling fish um, in, um, we were in uh, 400, yeah, I think we was in 400 feet of water, 400 feet of water out there in the deep ocean. And I really enjoyed myself out there. And so it was a good time. Amen. Varen, Pastor Varen Jacino, God bless you for watching. God bless you. Oh, yes, Crystal, I will. I will. Just send me an invitation. Send me a, um, a request, and I will. Joanne, God bless you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for coming. Everybody have a great evening. I'm trying to stay on just a little bit longer to wait for those who, you know, I can just acknowledge and just pray God's blessing over you and that God would bless and keep you and strengthen you so that you might be faithful to the call of Christ. Amen. This is the time. This is the season for us to walk up rightly before the Lord. Oh, Joanne, yes, I will enjoy the rest of my birthday. It is my plan. Um, but whatever the Lord wants me to do, um, I enjoy teaching. Um, I enjoy it so much. I enjoy the people of God and I enjoy ministry. And so there's no greater love for me. And so 
I'm having a good time. Though it's my birthday today, I'm having a great time in the Lord. And and there's so much peace and joy in my spirit right now. And so um having a good time, you know. And I still get out. I still get out and do things. Thank you, Melissa Thompson, for sharing the video. I appreciate you. God bless you. Oh, thank you, Joanne. To God be the glory. Thank you. Gwenita, first time listening. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming, my sister. Thank you. Marianne Baker, thank you for the birthday wishes. I appreciate it. But Gwenita, thank you for coming. I, um, send me a friend request if we're not friends already, and, um, and that way you'll know when we're on the next time. You're more than welcome. Any questions you have or anything that I said that wasn't clear, please let me know, and I'll do my best to sort of break it down a little bit easier. Amen? And so God bless you, Vanita. Thank you for that birthday wish again, my sister. Thank you so much. I, I love um, birthdays, whether it be mine or someone else's. Love it. Edna, that's how it's supposed to be. Be happy always in the Lord. Yes, Edna, you're right. Be happy in the Lord. Always. Always in God. Yeah. There's joy of the Holy Spirit. Pastor Jacino, thank you. Thank you for the birthday wishes. I appreciate it. Naisha, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That cake looks good. It looks good. Edna, amen. God bless you. And so we're, we're going to get ready to release you all so that you might spend time in prayer and in worship, thanking God for all that he's done, thanking God for his many blessings. The Lord is good and he's worthy to be praised. And so everyone, please, please have a great evening. Um, make sure all that you do for Christ. Oh, God bless you, Rose. Keisha, I'm here, here in Palm Harbor. I've never been in a bad hurricane like this. Just asking you to pray. Yes, in the name of Jesus, Keisha. Yes, yes. We've been praying for uh, many of our family. I have a brother that's in Florida. Um, and so I've been praying for Florida. I've been praying for Antigua, Puerto Rico. I've been praying for Barbuda, um, Bermuda. I've been praying for uh, Cuba. I've been praying for Houston. I've um, been praying for this entire nation because this is only the beginning of sorrows. And so we're praying for the people of God that wherever you are, that you would be in the presence of God. Make sure you are faithful to your Lord. Make sure you're faithful to God, and God will watch over you. And th if this is your end, if this is your season, then know this, that heaven is your home. And so God bless you. In fact, Valerie, I was supposed to uh, uh, go down to Florida in two weeks. Um, I was supposed to be down there in Florida. I was going to take a break for my birthday and just go down there and do some fishing and also visit the saints that I've been ministering to for years, to down there, um, but my trip has been postponed, and so um, uh, I'll let you guys know when I'm coming down there again, and and maybe we can meet up and and just hug on one another and just you know share the word of God, and so definitely praying for all of you, and even for those of us here because no one is safe um, from the wrath of God and for what's about to come on this earth. And so, you know, and these things are happening back-to-back -back successions and it's happening more rapidly. And the Word of God teaches us that when you see these things, it says stand in a holy place. And so we're definitely praying for you all. God bless you, Gladys. Gladys, God bless you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. Thank you, Edna. Yes, we're praying for you, my sister. We're praying for Keisha and, and for all of the people of God and around the world. God bless you, Lamont Hardison. Yes, yes, you're welcome. We're definitely praying for you all because we know that it is something that, you know, is is frightening. And for many people who, 
may lose their their homes, you know, or, or lose what they have, you know, as possessions, it's not easy. And for starting again or running and loss of life, and it's not easy. And so we're praying for you. So God bless each and every one of you. Thank you sincerely. God bless you. I appreciate it. That's a cool picture you got there. You look really cool. God bless you. May God continually bless and keep you. having me just wait a little bit longer and so we're just praying in our spirit that God would cover each of you cover them Lord cover them Lord thank you Siobhan thank you so much <laughs> this is just my heart praying to the Lord for God's people. Chris, God bless you. Yes. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Bless them, Father, in the name of Jesus. Cover them. Let there be no fear, no fear in their spirits. They shall not be moved, but they shall be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. God bless you all the way from the Netherlands. Hallelujah. God bless you. I believe it's Aldele or Alde, Alde. I believe. Beppo, God bless you. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. We love you all the way from here and all the way to there. May the Lord bless you and keep you. God bless you all. God bless you. God bless you. Father, watch over them. Cover them in the darkness of night. Lord God, let you be their light in the midst of the night. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. All right, Denise, Father God, give provision and protection, Father, in the name of Jesus for Denise, Lord God. I pray that you would give her holy wisdom and knowledge to know exactly what to do and when to do. Father, watch over Daphne, watch over her in the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, let your power fall when your name is called. Prove the dollar is wrong, for you're still mighty and strong. Bless them, Lord God. Cover them in the name of Jesus. No fear, no fear, Father. No worries, no worries, God. No anxieties in the name of Jesus. 
no anxieties, Father. No fear, God. In the name of Jesus, give them wisdom, Father, on what to do, what not to do. Give them favor, God. Give them protection. Put a shield around them. In the name of Jesus, Lord God. A shield of protection around them, Father. Cover them, Lord God, even when they don't know what to do next. Father, be their firm foundation in the name of Jesus. Firm foundation, God. No fear, no shifting sands in the name of Jesus. Yes, in the name of Jesus, Psalms 91 over your entire people. The Lord shall be your shield. The Lord shall be your right hand. The Lord shall cover you. He shall prevent you from falling. In the name of Jesus, the Lord is going to cover you on the left hand and the right hand. He will go before you and be behind you. In the name of Jesus, Father, we bless your holy name. Have your way, dear God. In the name of Jesus, have your way, dear God. Oh, God, cover them and everyone that's in their households. In the name of Jesus, Father, let the wind turn a different direction. Let the rain fall a different direction. God, let the waves flow a different direction. In the name of Jesus, man can do anything, Lord God, but they will fail. But God, you can do everything, and you do not fail. So bless your people, God, in the name of Jesus. Bless them, Father. Bless them, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Cover them, Father, in the name of Jesus. Cover them, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, cover your people in the name of Jesus. Cover them, Father. Protect them, Lord God. Protect them in the name of Jesus. Protect them, Lord God. Watch over them. In the name of Jesus. Yes, 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 Chris. Yes, Chris. Lord, give Chris even rest in the name of Jesus. Lord God, not looking down on anything, but Father, we bless and cover her right now in the name of Jesus. Right now, God, anything that she has, let it be more than enough. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let it be more than enough, Father. Thank you sincerely. God bless you. Let it be more than enough, God. More than enough. No complaints. No complaints. No complaints. No complaints. In the name of Jesus. Everything you give, you give enough, God. You give enough, God. Hallelujah. You give enough, God. And we thank you, Father. We thank you. You know exactly what we need. Father, the light that man creates is not our light, but you are our light. So illuminate our darkness in the name of Jesus. Oh God, set the captive free in the name of Jesus. Provide all that we need for you are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God, our provider. Father, we thank you for your provision. We thank you for your provision, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for your provision. We thank you, Father, for your provision. We thank you, Lord God. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Lord, for Rose Select, Patty Robinson. Thank you for her confession, Lord God. I pray right now in Jesus' name, Father, for a made-up mind, a made-up mind, a made-up mind, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, a made-up mind, oh God, in the name of Jesus, no longer a double mind, no longer, Lord God, halting between two opinions, in the name of Jesus, oh Father, bless her, bless her right now, in the name of Jesus. Bless her right now, God. Sold out for Christ. 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 In the name of Jesus. 
Father, call back the lost ones. Call back the lost ones. Call back those, Lord God, who are wandering. Call back those who are straying. Call back those, Father, who have fallen. Call back those who are living under condemnation. Call back those who are confused or distorted. Call back those who are wounded. Call back those, Lord God, who are hurting and broken. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, call them back, Father, with a love like never before, that they might love you more than life itself. Call them back, Father. This is the season. This is the time. Father, in the name of Jesus, call your people back. Call your people back, Lord Jesus. Call them back, Father. Holy Spirit of the living God, minister to our hearts in the name of Jesus. Feed us with the richness of your presence. Your presence is heaven to us. Your presence is heaven to us. Your presence is heaven to us. your holy name, God. Bless your holy name, Father. Be glorified. Be glorified. Be glorified, Father. Be glorified in our lives. Be glorified in our lives. We thank you, Father, and we bless you. In the name of Jesus, we glorify you. your name. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray for everyone who have watched tonight and those, Lord God, who even stayed on this long. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name that you would feed their souls and that you would bless them with a life that is sold out for you. We glorify you and we magnify your holy name for you alone are worthy to be praised. Have your way in their lives and be exalted in them. Let your name be praised and high and lifted up. And Father, we will give your name all of the glory, all of the honor, and all the praises. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. God bless you. Toyina Ford, God bless you. Angela, God bless you. Stephen Myers, God bless you. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Chris. Thank you. Amen. You guys have a wonderful evening. Stay in the presence of God. He'll never fail you. The Lord will never fail you. Trust in him. The Bible says anyone that puts their trust in him will never be brought to shame. Trust in him. Thank you so much, sincerely. I appreciate you. Thank you, my sister. Angela, God bless you. Mia, God bless you. Thank you, you all, for staying with me this long. I appreciate you, and your time is valuable, and I thank you. Benita, God bless you. Thank you for staying. Sincerely, God bless you. Have a great evening. You guys get some rest, and be ready. Be ready. Rosalette, God bless you. You're welcome. God bless you, my sister. Amen. All right, everyone. Have a blessed evening. Until we meet again. God bless you.